This is uh, The Bennington Show. I'm Ron Bennington, and uh, also here with Gail Bennington. We are the only father-daughter radio show in history, and this is a a tough one for us to do today. Um, over the weekend, um, and it was up when I was in Boston, doing the show at the Wilbur, which couldn't have been uh, any more fun and just such a great audience and such a great town. Um, I got the call that my dad passed away. And anyone who's uh, listened to me and Gail on the show over the years knows how the way we felt about that guy. Um, my mother and father were married for... 72 years and um there's a lot to be grateful for um and my dad's uh death is something that i had prepared myself for for a long time over diff different occasions uh but it's still um uh, it still shocked me and still was a blow and i'm very i'm even surprised by that um and of course gail is going through this uh as well yeah um getting that call this weekend it's crazy to think that there's been uh times that we've prepared ourselves even i think it was maybe like two years ago yeah. you, you and i took a trip up there just because we weren't we weren't sure and uh, this guy's such a fighter that every time we thought things looked uh, rough, uh, we'd be talking a couple weeks later like he's doing great. And yeah. uh, this would happen time and time again. So, yeah, it is funny to say that uh, it's shocking, even though uh, despite his age. Um, but uh, this guy is also the center of my family, my uh, extended family, him and my grandmother um, are the hub. Um, yeah. And uh, he is uh, so incredibly loved, you know, from our perspective, because uh, me and my dad talk about him all the time. But uh, he has kids and grandkids and great grandkids who could tell you a million stories yeah. about uh who who he was to them uh and uh he's uh he's so so loved you know uh, it's funny when you always talk about perspectives with us because i remember when you guys were kids and he would come down and take you on these you know trips around florida and he would be so happy and he would get the biggest kick out of you. I remember saying to you and your brother, uh, I don't know that dude. You know what I mean? I don't know the guy that you know <laughs> who's so happy to go to amusement parks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he was a different guy. And then, of course, there was a different guy that I never met. You know what I mean? Um, there's a, a picture of him in, from World War II. Okay. So he goes and halfway through high school you got to graduate back then and then he was off the boot camp and off to the philippines and you see this picture because he would always talk about himself you know oh when i was in the navy you know we had a layover here and then he's a child he's 17 years old he yeah. had never been i'll say a hundred miles away from the uh from his home and the next thing you know, he's on the other side of the world. And, uh, you know, uh, when I met Jack Vaughn, who works here, his father was a couple years older than my dad. So he was a college uh, graduate, went into the Navy, and he was uh, a, a kind of an officer in the Philippines when my dad was there. And I, and I read his book, and I'm like, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty hairy. And my dad only really began to, to talk about that over the last couple of years. You were the one that first got him to, to discuss any time in the military. We had never heard about it. And uh, I know for the funeral that we're going to have this week, he gets the military honors or whatever. Yeah. For being, 
And um, I think he would have gotten a kick out of that. I think up on the Instagram, there's a picture that Gail sent me this morning. Um, no, I guess that hasn't gone up yet. Uh, but we'll wait for it. Um, uh, I had never seen that picture before you sent it to me. Um, all right, there it is. This is... Uh, So we were in Canada, I'm sure, by this picture. And that's, I guess, either a tent or it might be uh, my Uncle Ray's yeah. Nimrod, um, which was half trailer, half tent. But that picture of my dad, the reason why it stunned me so much is that's my dad when I was growing up. And you can see, you know what I mean? You can see, like, almost that kind of guy doesn't exist anymore. You yeah. Know? I think that's why I loved that picture so much, because uh, you would always kind of remind me what a different guy he was uh, from when I was a kid versus you were a kid. And uh, I thought, man, this is uh, someone who's, like, vaguely familiar to me. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yet, it, you know, it's still him. But I could see... Uh, a part of him I'd never seen before when I saw this photo. Well, I guarantee you this, just from looking at that. The fact that the sun's out means that he's already been fishing. I yeah. probably have not woken up yet, but he's already back out because he would go out in the morning and fish that lake um, and then would uh, come back and then uh, take the kids out yeah. fishing. You know? I think as he described it, to me was that it was a break from fishing like it was his morning coffee break so he had already been fishing he had already told you that yeah and uh that picture kills me man. you know it's funny uh i was talking to with my grandmother about um just kind of the way you know someone the way that they are their mannerisms their dress and uh you know, my dad grew up with this guy in a suit. And yeah. for me, you know, I picture him always like in a flannel shirt and a baseball cap. And it's just so funny. It's like a, it's a, a different person. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's what we do throughout our lives. But, you know, I'm going to correct you, though. He never wore a suit. He wore a white shirt and tie to work. Yeah. Right? Never, a tie. never a full suit. You know, because this was a, a working man's look when you go back there. But if you wanted to know the way he looked every day to me, um, he, the dress was the same dress that you would see with the NASA engineers, the guys that oh, were yeah. in the thing where you would see that kind of a black tie with a white shirt. And it was, it was the other thing. It was always a short sleeve white shirt you mm -hmm. never even see, i don't even know if they make them anymore. <laughs> but the point was um he was always in a factory and you don't want to get your shirt sleeves yeah caught in any of the machines i don't know why they insisted on the tie you know what i mean the tie seems that like seems, a very yeah. dangerous thing um jenny hutt just waved in the window um that was very nice of her no she's it looks like she's trying to drive what is she doing let her Earl, let her say, what, does she have something she wants to say? I'm going to hug you guys. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just, Can I'm I, just so sorry. I just saw on the picture you posted on, yeah. a, on Instagram. the Bennington Instagram yeah. of your dad. Yeah. So, and Gail, I mean. This is very nice, you. It's very up. sweet. I'm sorry. Let me uh, apologize to you because. Do not apologize. Uh, no, I can't no. hear him. I have, yeah, I know. My producers are. <laughs> They're in their own world today. No, um, I'm just but, sorry. I just know that the, the grief, it's just a horrible I know. griefing. And you're, you'll, it sucks, okay? So I can't even tell you that you're going to be just you. fine because it just fucking sucks. Thank you. I, I'm apologizing to you for something too. I made the mistake of telling Rich Voss <laughs> that you own bunny eyes. And because they've he, already been sent his way. I mean, while I'm saying this, he's texting. Oh, God. Backstage. Oh. Listen, uh, 
I know you're at work, which is astounding, and just your yeah. commitment to your your listeners and Gail, you too, that you guys are here. But take care of yourself because, yeah. like, these are feelings that they're just gonna. They just they just there's nothing you can't there's you know literally nothing you could do but feel them so thank I mean, you there are very things much. you could do that you're not gonna do is my point thank you um but I love you and you know thank that you. of course Gail, I know that. I, uh, I'm gonna stop being jackass and stop crying Goodbye. no I'm sorry it's very sweet of you um she is right about one thing number one I didn't expect to get hit like that the other night I was so mad that I wasn't with my mom my mom was alone with my dad when uh he died and i always thought i'll be there you know uh, to support but honestly we've talked about this the way my mom and dad were with each other and the way they were together um it only makes sense that they would have been alone together yeah i uh completely uh inseparable the two of them and as you said married for uh 72, 72 years. years and uh my pop was just madly in love yeah. i mean he's the way he talks about my grandmother like he's still a kid when he talks about her yeah uh and my grandmother has been by his side since she was a teenager, since she was 16 years my old. My dad got home from World War II. He was introduced to my mom. Um, she was 16 years old. There's a picture of the two of them on the beach uh, on the Chesapeake Bay uh, the day they met. My dad... Uh, lived eventually mile mile and a half away from that yeah his whole world was in that uh little area that's where he he also the house that he was in was a, a place that was like a summer cottage for us and my dad built it my dad physically built it yeah. and then as the years went by they added on you know some extensions so he's with the girl that he met coming back from World War II. He marries her, has a baby, not very long after that. Uh, and, you know, went through that post-World War II almost stereotypical life of, you know, first house is a row house. Um, and then, you know, the shot to the suburbs with the yard and you know little league baseball and all that i mean just billy joel wrote about it in allentown you know what i mean it is that entire generation's life um that was what we call and i think it was invented then the term american dream you know what i mean like nobody i don't think said the american dream back you know yeah. in the 1890s or whatever so everything has been set up in that direction and they lived that life um and obviously they weren't able to understand certainly my generation of not sharing and all that you know what i mean of having a different path to that i mean when when you really look at it it's uh it's pretty astounding that Every, everything went from that direction. I mean, this was a kid who grew up in the Depression, fatherless in the Depression, went to World War II, came back, married by the time he's 20. You know what I mean? Yeah. Married with a home at 20. And, you know, working through corporations his entire life up until retirement. And being with my, uh, married to my mom for 72 years. Yeah. Is that ever going to happen again? No, it's a totally different world. It's a different now. world. I even remember him uh, kind of talking to me and my brother years ago. Kind of asking us what we were up to, plans with, uh, with uh, 
family and and marriages and things yes. like that and really pressuring us and then he started to lay out where he was at that time and we're like well that's a very different world pop yes. you know i mean it's hard to imagine well, the uh the amount that you had built a family at such a young age imagine this you're my dad right and when you were a kid you had worked four different jobs while you were in school to give the money directly to your mom you're preparing yourself to fight either the nazis or the empire of japan you had no direction you know you had right. no idea what front you would be going to right you come back you get married you take care of your mom once you yes. you know you get back here and then you have a son like me and you come home after working all day and there he is in cut off shorts. You know what I mean? L sleeping on the couch after getting whacked, you know, at school with zero plans for the future and zero concerns about the future. You know what I mean? Like if you would just see how different we were, uh, you know, how like people would say, oh, find something that you love to do and that job will make you happy. My father had the feeling as of take a job, do it really well, no matter what that job is, and that will bring some kind of contentment and happiness to your life, and you can take that money and 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 and, and make a life. It didn't even dawn on me. You know what I mean? It didn't even dawn on me. But he must have seen me as the most gender fluid person. You know what I mean? <laughs> Listening to Bowie, he's wearing platform shoes. <laughs> And yet we still had this yeah bond we still had this uh relationship I never um I never doubted that even through all the rough years that you can have when you're a teenager if you're just tuning in um Gail and I are in today my father passed away over the weekend and um like we said anybody who's listened to this show for any length of time um knows how much uh that we loved and respected my dad and how crushed we are for my mom and and the rest of our family and um we're going to do this uh show today and then uh we're going to go be with family um the rest of the week but um we did want to talk about him a little bit today you know, the thing about him that is just remarkable is that he had all these different facets of his life that I think that he was uh, genius level at. You know, he he had a mind for history. Uh, he was an engineer. He uh, The fact that, you know, sometimes he would go into a story about something and and be able to recall all of the history and the dates and the names and everything was just always so so remarkable because his mind was just so beyond me uh and as you said uh only a couple years ago he had opened up and he was talking about uh the war and being a kid in the war uh with me and to me it was like probably the that day that i spent with him because I sat there and uh, recorded it and interviewed him and uh, yeah. probably. And you remember how my mom wasn't happy about She was that. not happy. Because she didn't she, think you should talk about stuff. She didn't think, and she said also, you know, that you shouldn't talk about stuff like that and you should leave the dead <laughs> yeah, quiet in peace. She doesn't like, I mean, he was also incredibly interested in family history and genealogy and things like that. And she just felt like that was meddling, which is so funny how opposite they were with that. But uh, when I talked to him, there was probably about a hundred things I had never heard from him. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to me was that uh, that feeling of being a kid and knowing that the war was on. And he was like, I almost feel guilty and silly admitting this, but you kind of were like, I hope this war keeps up so I'm not, I'm not one of these people who didn't go, you know. He right. he just wanted to join up and he didn't want uh to look like the kind of person who didn't go and serve and be a part of this war. And um uh, so when uh 
when they go and you, you do the test, you know, you're, you're given the test. Uh, he says the guy comes back to him and says about his, uh, his scores that they were off the charts, right? Because he was insanely smart. And so he says, look, this is what I want to do with you. He basically offered him uh, to go in like, um, what would you call it? Like a decoder, like uh, kind of working intelligence. And he's explaining to this to him. And he's like, no, that's not what guys in my neighborhood do. So I don't want to do that. And he's like, it will be a waste to your country if you don't do this. And he's like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to join up then. That's not the kind of thing I want to do. And he goes, fine, then what we're going to do is we're going to put you through medical school and we'll fund that. And, you know, then you'll be a doctor for us. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you're, yeah, you're the military. You'd be with the Navy. So uh, he says, nope, that's not, that's not how I pictured this. This isn't what I'm going to do. I mean, I want to go and fight in the war. That's what I think. And he said, this is my final offer to you because otherwise this would be a waste of your mind. Um, we, I can, you know, you can go into engineering. We'll put you in the Navy. And finally, he agreed to that. And to me, this was like this changes the course of his life is he's offered these three different paths all yeah. based on how geniusly smart he was. Well, uh, and again, it wasn't something that was caught on to at the time, because like I said, he was in public school. Uh, he. um yeah, he was just a kid, yeah. you know what I mean? But when, when he went there, and, and they were like, well, we tested you. What they didn't, I don't know whether they knew, but because of this, he, like, the whole time that he was in school, he was studying the the shapes and sizes of planes so that he could be a signal man yeah. and notice the planes and be able to signal back and forth. Yeah. And he goes, when I got there, and this is like how all people, he goes, it seemed like none of the other guys had taken this approach. You know what I mean? It had no, yeah. any idea. But he said uh, up on his wall that he had pictures of different Japanese planes and just silhouettes so that he'd be able to tell whether it was night or not. And I was just cracking up because I'm sure I wouldn't have been one of those people oh, who no. cared about the sizes and shapes of, of planes. But, you know, when he got out, he didn't stay. I mean, he did his whatever years it was, but then he came back and just went into the factories. He didn't. Yeah. He he later uh, got a, a college education 100% of the time through night school. You know what I mean? Like just going like, so the whole time I was a kid, probably even with the picture that we have up on the Instagram of him, is like my dad would come home from work. He would be tense. We would have this dinner that's much more of a formal dinner than anyone has today. Like my mom would make this formal meal. All the kids would be around the table. My grandmother would be sitting there. My dad would normally talk about his day and then go around the table and each person had to explain what you know they did at school that day. And then maybe we'd talk about the news a little bit and then dinner would be over and, you know, we'd all be excused. And then basically he went and did homework for yeah. college and then went off, you know, to his classes at night. So it's not like I really have a lot of memories of my dad relaxing or lounging or any of that kind of stuff. He was an intense, busy guy. Yeah. And it wasn't until he retired that he had that other kind of time. And I can tell you, he hated anything not working. He eventually went and started working for the church, uh, uh, you know, first coming in, you know, just something to do. And then he started to do their accounting and stuff. And he had never done any of that kind of stuff before but he did not like the idea in the last couple of years he was almost sitting in a chair most of the day and he every time me and him talk he bitched he goes one thing i want to do is as soon as my legs get stronger is i want to get back to work and then he would always tell me like yeah i want to take a tree down in the backyard too which has uh, yeah. been bothering me for a while i'm afraid of, i'm like okay yeah but he wasn't going to you know yeah not I'm with his legs like that thinking even like a a year or two ago, I went to visit him and uh, my husband and I were there and he was just saying 
about how he was different projects in the yard yeah. and some steps that he needed to fix and we're just like he could not relax man no he uh he always uh had something to do and that's true i mean even uh in his retirement he always had projects and i'm i think about this too it's like uh all the amazing aspects of his life when i was a little kid he was doing carpentry that was unbelievable yeah. just unbelievable something he had taken up and uh he was so uh truly talented at it and it was just a thing to do for him uh but he just had the patience and and the skill and it was really Focused. beautiful stuff he used to make stuff for um now i have clocks clocks he, he would make you know like uh i have a clock in my living room that he that he made the um the other thing uh and i remember jack was so shocked to hear this is that when he was about 85 for the church he designed a website for them yeah and like how many people do you know that are 85 they don't even no. know what the internet is no. and then he was like oh this could be something good and you know we'll put the history of the church in here and whoever wants to read it can read it yes you know and and he kept so connected because of things like that you know and the internet was like fascinating to yeah him. he i mean i think about now think about the the kind of kid he was the fact that he could have access to information would have been amazing to him as yeah. a young person so he treated it um just as fascinating right you know instead of being like oh in my day we used to go to the library and look something up he was like great this is a new way to it's do things tool. and he embraced it and mm -hmm. i i hope that i uh i keep that with me because it's taught me a lot about um aging and the way you you well, stay connected to the world around you. i already don't have that <laughs> I already don't have that. That's the other thing is I'm not sure that he passed anything on to his children or grandchildren in terms of intellect. Oh, I look around and I'm like, no, oh, no, none you're of a us, bunch of mouth breathers. You know what always used to make me think that is when he would be launching into a story about history and I would be sitting there, me and my brother and my cousins and, uh, he would say something and he's like well you know how this would happen and uh we would all just like look at him like no we didn't know that and you could see in his face he was he's just like well who am i talking to why don't you know these things but, but he you, uh you know what a, a shock it was to him that he found out that i was skipping school all the time and you know like i remember him saying to me before when he came to school he goes look if you, when you get your books, if you read that book, you know, the first weekend, just read it cover to cover, everything will come so much easier to you in the, in the, um, in the lessons. I'm like, read a school book cover yes. to cover? What are you, nuts? I remember him telling this to me as a child, like, why don't you take the time when you get your textbook to read through the whole textbook? And then this way, the lessons will be simpler. And I think I was just like this. Pop, I think they want you to take your time. <laughs> you know, they really want us to go lesson by lesson. They've, they've had this planned out. <laughs> it's just it's just so uh, entirely different, you know, uh, the way our, our minds work. But it makes me kind of think of... Um, well, here's the thing. Uh, the, you do... I, he didn't make us feel bad about it. No. But I know it must have felt strange to him, you know? Yeah. And I think, too, about, um, like, his, the how sweet he was to connect to each of his kids and his grandkids and his great-grandkids. And he, he really, um, he really wanted to be connected to each of us. And I think about this, uh, story from when I was a kid that, uh, he was visiting us in Florida, and uh, like I said, he everything history he was interested in. And so there was this documentary series about whalers and the history of whaling. And between history and being a fisherman, I think everything about it interested him, and he wanted to watch it. 
and he wanted me to watch it with him. And he was trying to explain certain things to me. And, and of course, in this documentary, horrific photographs of whaling. And I'm like, as you can hear, very sensitive person. So as a child, now magnify this. So now I'm seeing like whales with harpoons sticking out of them. And I, I start to cry hysterically. And my... And my grandmother comes in and she starts screaming at him. Lee, why would you make her watch something like this? A, a little girl doesn't want to watch something like this. And he was like, I thought you'd be interested in the history. And I was just like, did they live? And I, I wasn't really getting that he yeah. thought that he was going to. So um, he felt really you bad. You understand there was lamp oil that came out yes, of that. Yes, exactly. Ink. So he, uh, I think he felt really bad about it. Uh, well, mostly because my grandmother made him feel really bad. She really yelled at him. And uh, after he had gotten home, he had left, he, uh, a couple weeks later, I get in the mail this box, and he had written me this letter about how um, silly it was that he had made me do that, but he was really moved about my, uh, my heart and my sensitivity. <laughs> and... Uh, it stayed with him, like, that uh, I had such empathy for a fish, you know, like, in his mind. And um, so then he had carved me this beautiful whale. And uh, it really meant a lot to me as a kid because I know he had, like, connections with each, everybody. Sometimes it was baseball or, you know, sports with my brother or fishing with his son and I, I think uh, it really meant a lot to me he's a great great guy and I'm I'm gonna miss him we'll be back Bennington Bennington is back and uh, today we are remembering uh, my pop Lee Bennington uh, you know uh just hearing that Willie, I think it was about the only question he ever asked us out of people that we interviewed. How's Willie doing? Yeah. You know, he uh, uh, he was a Willie Nelson fan, but uh, I think the whole thing that he thought because we interviewed Willie, we stayed in touch. Yeah. It always <laughs> cracked cool. me up. Do you hear anything back from Willie? <laughs> well, we didn't do a song together, Pop, but... Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, he would hear, he'd be like, I'm not hearing much about him. See, okay? <laughs> very, very sweet. Um, this is always uh, uh, a difficult thing for for everybody. For everybody goes through this. And I had uh, obviously prepared myself for a long time about losing my dad. But I was shocked that uh, how suddenly... It happened, and I was in Boston. I'm just ready to go on stage when I'm hearing, you know, he's on his way to the hospital. And I thought, well, I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll head out of here. I'll even fly, whatever I've got to do. But that thing that you just can't ever really prepare yourself, you know. And then last night I'm watching uh, the World Series. And, you know, I'm like... Uh, You just have that thing of this is, you know, a connection. Yeah. And, um, and that hurts. And just, you know, saying the Nationals losing would have given us a lot of uh, happiness. And then he would have, he had already uh, not liked the Nationals fans for, for booing, uh, for, you know, at the Phillies. Because we took their player and they boo the hell out of him there. So he would have tied that in with Trump sure. getting booed. You know oh, what I yeah, mean? Absolutely. Said, I told you these guys. And that, uh, you know, this is one of those things that uh, I, I don't even want to say take it for granted because I'm I sure I didn't take anything yeah. for granted as the years went by, you know. And I was. Uh, fortunate that i didn't lose my dad young like a lot of my friends have because they have all those unanswered things or i didn't get a chance to tell him and uh 
he never got a chance to tell me. We had those moments. There's nothing. There's nothing. Um, there's nothing left to say. Yeah, really. it's uh, strange. I was thinking that too. Is that at my age, to have him in my life, um, that my my daughter was alive at the same time as a great grandfather, which right. is crazy. And she's the youngest of his uh, yeah. great grandkids. So you know that he uh, that we all got to keep him for so long is. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. It's it's crazy. Well, you know, you you take a lot of pictures of Juju, and then the pictures you take, I send to my mom and dad. Yeah. And then we discuss those pictures, and and then both of them have said to us, we really feel like we watched this kid growing up. And at one point, it occurred to me because of the phones and all, you've taken more pictures of Juju than. I have family pictures ever. You I know, know what I mean? Because yeah. ours would be a picture, you know, when you finally got enough of them, it would go away and they come back. Most of the pictures you saw were of taken with me were taken by my grandmother, right? Yeah. Uh, who lived with us. And she had this old box camera that when you would look into, the, pic the, the thing would be upside down. I mean, she must have had a camera from... I'm going to guess the 1930s or 40s yeah. at the very latest. Yeah, it's got to be. I wonder where that camera is. Somebody would love to have that camera. So, I mean, she took the, she used that camera all the way through the 70s. <laughs> That's you know, crazy. and then there you, so it was a big deal. Like everyone stands still. We're yeah. going to have this picture taken. And then you're just there when your phone, you, you take 20 and pick out three, you know, that you send. It's yeah. crazy when you think about it's, it. It's, um, I'm very uh I'm very grateful that uh that we were able to have that connection, you know, that technology was able to to bridge that distance. Yeah. Um that it's such a unique thing cuz I even think about Pop showing me um the video you had sent him when I I was just a newborn. And uh, like you had rented a camera and you'd right, have to like mail, yeah. mail this like yeah. giant VHS or whatever to them. And then we used order. all the 45 minutes. I mean, it's ridiculously <laughs> boring. You know what I mean? We're dull. just like, and you're doing good and the baby's here. Um, But yeah, that he and he still hung on to that as he did uh, everything. You know, yeah. he uh really held on to family photos and videos and all of that was uh really precious to him because he's he's like the family historian yes he is well also uh because my parents when you were little they had you know uh, retired and then we lived in florida it gave them the excuse to come down in the winters yeah and you know they would spend a lot of time with you and your brother and then also for spring training, they were there for, you know, all the spring training and I had uh, season tickets to that. But when your brother was really little, me and my pop and my son went to ball games together. As a matter of fact, like that was like a potty trading thing for him. We're like, hey, you can't have Pampers at the ball game. You right. know what I mean? You got to be ready to go. And he's like, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can do this. You know? Um, yeah. And then, you know, you have that. And again, I have so many friends that have never had that experience of being at the at the baseball game. And I mean, spring training was always just the best. It was the old Jack Russell Stadium, you know, which was like cement and then bleachers. Yeah. I mean, it was really, really that. old school. Now it was like, oh my God, this place is great. It's like a small version of Yankee Stadium. You don't want that. You know what I mean? You, you really do want rickety bleachers yeah. and see these guys 12 feet away from you. You know what I mean? I mean, mm, that's how I think of baseball because yeah. that was like my greatest connection with it you right know? um and just like the best memories of going there with you guys you and pop and my brother i understand i didn't 
put you in that lineup, but what I was trying to say... <laughs> I, I was mean, I was do- at some of the games. <laughs> some of them, not 100%. You and Fez literally were there for the snacks <laughs> yeah. most well, of the time. Yeah, we did discuss a lot about what snack, what inning snacks we Dude, were my at. My father has brought up to me so many times about Fez... Drinking beer and eating ice cream at the same time. Obsessed. Obsessed. I remember he's that like, he he was excited to tell everybody about it that day, and I yeah. don't think he's ever stopped. No. It's like his greatest association with Fez. Right, because he just thinks about that curdling in his stomach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the heat, in the yeah. Florida heat. <laughs> um, I, uh, I thought maybe we could play that thing that Jay Moore liked when I was talking about when when the Phils won the World Series. And um, it's about, you know, baseball and the way my dad felt about it and the way he, you know, uh, passed that along to me, you know, that that thing. But I don't think I can listen to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not, uh, I'm not up for, for that today. Um, so I don't know. I haven't. I don't even know if I've ever gone back and listened to it. I know every once in a while my brother will say I listen to that thing again, um, because it's like forty five minutes. It's just uh, talking about the, you know that thing when the when your team wins something. All the people that you're thinking about while that's going on. Right. People that don't understand sports don't understand that thing of like your team's in the World Series and you know everyone that you haven't seen since first grade is watching that game. Yeah. You know, and how bad I wanted to fill the win this thing for my dad. Right. You know what I mean, like that thing of I know he might never get another World Series. Yeah. I mean, this is how long ago. <laughs> what was the year that the Phillies Nearly won? 10. 2008. 2008 is when they won? 2008 yeah. is when they won, yeah. And when did they lose 2009. to the 2009. All right, so the following year they went back. And then we're like, hey, if we win, we win. But I thought it was great that they were playing the Yanks in the World Series, too. But that thing of, like, I, here I am 11 years ago thinking I'm going to lose my dad any moment. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and then why does it still hit me so hard today that I got this extra time? Yeah, I mean, it is weird to think that uh, we've been in that, in that state and even more recently uh, just with his health. And yet it's just an utter shock and the reason is because um that guy has been always so so vibrant and so connected you know um and uh it's funny because he i think sports and like you said uh even politics sometimes it's like it it kept him so present yeah you know he always had something to talk about right. he always was there you know well, um, we'll uh, we'll play this um, piece, but I'm gonna I'm gonna walk out of the room. I don't think that um, I can hear me being so. I don't know what the hell I was that day, you know. But um, I do thank uh, people for um, for sharing this with us today. And maybe when we get back after this break, we'll take some calls from people. If you like, 844-ROCK-GOD, 844-ROCK-GOD. Because even though this feels so unique, when it happens to you, it happens to everybody, Mm -hmm. you know? It happens to everybody. And, uh, you know, we're working with two guys who never really had that opportunity to, you know, have that with their dad. Uh, Earl has it but with a black dad so his <laughs> life i know that must be so difficult earl i'm sorry and unique experience growing by the way up. earl's dad is so great he's <laughs> everything you want him to be he is so old school new york that it's unbelievable so i mean um now uh you and earl are the only ones on the show yeah that have a living dad yeah and I'm over on the loser side I with know, these I can't two believe idiots. You crossed over hey, to their side. I know Chris was happy about that. No. <laughs> uh, I have said this, uh, but I'll say it again. Um, I'm very, very grateful that I knew 
what my dad thought of me, and I knew uh, that I expressed to my dad what I thought about him, and and you know he's from a generation that weren't big for that kind of expression, you know. So I didn't know that when I was in high school, and I didn't know this when I was a young adult. But uh, as years went by, hugging became an easier thing for him. <laughs> yeah. Kiss became an easier thing for him, and saying "I love you." So I'm very fortunate. You know, and again, this is what I said. You know, eleven years before my dad died. So, yeah, uh, I was okay with being flowery. I, I don't know what Chris is pulling out of this. I just, uh, I'm going to have uh, faith that you know this all makes sense. But this is from after the Phils won the World Series, right? Yes, this is uh, my dad talking the Phillies and my pop. You're watching this thing, and obviously, 99% of why I was watching that game last night and feeling sick to my stomach was for my old man, a guy who grew up this, you know, spent his whole life a baseball fan. And those are the guys that need to be uh, serviced. And I know you feel the same way. Dave is another kid that was, you know, taken to the ballpark when you're younger. It really is about those feelings. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's where the tradition uh, should come in. I was watching that game last night, and I was literally going, uh, let, let himself have this. I wasn't <laughs> saying for those kids. I was saying, <laughs> give it to this guy who's now in his 80s and has been a Phillies fan his entire life, watching every game. When I think about baseball and I look at that team, I think of my father. That's some of the greatest memories I've had in my life is being with my dad at the uh, ball game. I remember, literally, can remember first game I ever went to in my entire life. And with my uh, two uncles, remember the first time I ever walked into a, a, a baseball stadium. And that is the kind of stuff that really I would love to see him get back to uh, preserving. I really would. I, here's the, the one of the strangest things, and I don't even know if I've even talked about that, but we used to go up um, in those days, you could either go up on a bus with the VFW, or you could go up with my dad's uh, work, and they would literally have a bus. And I can remember being a little kid, and so little that I was like, could stand up on the seat during the bus ride and with my head out the window, knowing that we were going to the ballpark, hearing all the guys uh, laughing. Guys were smoking on the bus, smoking cigars, smoking cigarettes. And they would have this uh, giant trash can filled with beer and sodas for the kids. And I can honestly remember that being the coldest drink I ever had in my life. Just being with those guys, hearing them talk and bitch about the game on the way up. Uh, after a win, everybody would be laughing on the way back or bitching on the way back. And I really feel like that's 99% of what the whole thing is about. Just a chance for fathers and sons to get together. I remember going to those games uh, with my pop. And then years later, in Florida, I had had spring training tickets, which there is nothing in sports like spring training. There is nothing as hopeful and as, as close to what it can be for uh, playing hooky uh, as sitting there watching spring training games over and over and over. You, there's literally no pressure to it. The other thing that I was thinking about last night, uh, I used to go up to the games with my pop and uh, my Uncle Bill. And my Uncle Bill was like an old guy at the time. He used to, every game he had this fake uh, radio that was just, it looked like he was carrying an old-fashioned radio, but it was really hollowed out, and he always had a flask in there, and he would pull the flask out, like, where'd this come from? Every single game, he would act like the greatest thing he ever did was to, to pull that thing out, look around, take a pull off of it, and uh, pass it around. And he was a real baseball guy. And literally, and I never forget this, every 
a single funeral we were ever at, he would say, tough league to get a hit in. Every single time he would say to us, tough league to get a, a hit in. Because there was nothing that we could say. And I remember being at his funeral, and my dad turned to me and he said, what do you think, tough league? I said, yeah, it is a tough league to get a hit in. I was really thinking about him last night, too. And thinking about my pop, because he is one of those guys that just is not an angry fan. He's not a guy who... who really cares all that much about winning and losing. And I, I, I busted his balls a few times when the Phillies are really bad and he's still following them. And he would always say, there's always one player that you can watch, even in a bad year. There's one guy that you could say, how did he pull that one off? Um, look at him. He's moving up. There's always something for him to watch. My dad does. Uh, the, the other cool thing about it is, uh, and this is one of the, the craziest things that I got to thank radio for, is... Because of being in radio, I got to play with the Dream Week guys. I did that about five years, and it's an unreal experience where you're playing with the guys that you grew up watching. They coach you all week long, and you're playing with other guys uh, that have signed up for this Dream Week experience. And then at the end of the uh, end of the of, of the week. You play against the pros, and you're out there, and you're playing, you're pitching against guys who pitched in World Series, and they're all just busting your balls, and you're having a great time. You do the dinner at the, uh, that, that night, and the, one of the great things about baseball is nobody tells funnier stories than baseball players, and they just sit there and rip each other, rip the guys who played, and I was sitting there with my dad, and I was just watching them, you know, rubbing tears out of his eyes because he's laughing so hard at some of these stories and leaving and having him say to me I think that was the best night of my whole life just the flat out best night of my whole life and really that's exactly the main reason that I was so tense this week is just letting a guy who's had now the second time his team has won a World Series over his entire life of being a fan Two World Series wins he gets, a guy in his 80s. And I, uh, you know, the other thing about baseball, and I know all the other guys know this too, is that it always does give you something to discuss with your, with your dad on times that you and your dad aren't getting along. I went through my teen years, you know, I, I left uh, the first time I, I hit the road, I was 17. And whenever I would call back, whether my dad was happy with me or not, we ended up talking about the ball game. Uh, so I had to make sure that I read box scores and checked out box scores because I knew that was going to come up and I, I would know that that would be part of the conversation. To this day, in the summer, any time between February and October, I check the box scores before I, I call home because I know at some point my old man and me are going to be talking about those uh, games. It's politics will uh, piss us off. Things I've done in my life will piss us off. Baseball we can still talk about. So I give him a call last night after the uh, last out, and uh, we uh, we just kind of go over the and uh, the entire time. I'm just like, let him pull this. Let him just have this win. I got him the Comcast uh, a couple years ago. The man is 83 years old and watches 162 games a year. Does not miss a game. Sits there on the porch watching the ball game. And when that's over, he'll flip over to another one. So I give him a call last night, uh, feeling happy for him. And he's not, you know, he's not dancing in the streets. He's just, we go over the game. We talked about Otley. We talked about uh, the pitching. We talked about where this season could have went wrong. Because he says to me, he goes, you know, in September, we're three and a half games behind the Mets. I thought that was the end of it. There was no way to get in. And it was a really great thing for, for me for the main reason to have a guy who's 83 years old say to you, that was a really good year, huh? That was a really good year. I, I, I would really hope for everybody 
that you could say to yourself when you're 83 years old, that was a good year. And I would hope for all, uh, for anybody listening to, to have the experience to have uh, your dad still with you when he's 83 years old. And I'm going to say that was a really good year. And uh, my Uncle Bill is right. It's a tough league to get a hit in. But every once in a while, you get a hold of the ball and you fucking ride it out. It's uh, the Bennington Show. That's as close as uh, Chris could come to finding the uh, theme to um, one of my dad's uh, favorite movies of all time, and that's The Quiet Man. He was a uh, fan of two things, John Wayne and Paladin. Yeah. There was a movie, and I don't even know them. There was a TV show called Paladin, <laughs> uh, I think from the 1950s. And then anytime this guy was in a movie, he just called him Paladin. <laughs> And he was always kind of a a bad guy, and um, all right. So he was in Have Gun Will Travel was the name of that. Yeah. And was was he the hero? Because I never saw him once play a hero. What's his name? This actor's name. The the actor's name is. Was that Richard Boone? Thank you very Richard much. Boone. When you, by the way, what Chris just did with uh, a great thing, which just repeat the sentence okay. while you're trying right. to search. Mm -hmm. The actor's name is the and thing you're the requesting. Don't yeah. know what it is. Richard Boone. <clears throat> uh, if you are just joining us, uh, um, my father passed away uh, over the weekend um, when I was at the Wilbur in Boston with the Creeps. And uh, Gail and I are doing this show today, and then we're going to go be with family for the rest of the week. Um, you know, I'm very, very grateful. My father lived to be 92 years old. And not only did he get to know my children, but my children's children. And uh, that's a lucky thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy rare. So it makes it hard to explain why we're feeling just like <laughs> such a hole in our heart yeah because it feels like we've been given so much i know we've been given such a gift of having this guy in our life um and yet i feel so um so empty just thinking about him gone and i i keep having this weird sensation you know i've been uh his home like you said the house that he built um has been such a part of my life me and my brother's childhood along with his own kids that it's to us uh, uh, you know kind of our big constant because we moved around a lot so to us that's like that place that we go back every to. thanksgiving yes summer trips. summers and um and the thought of going there and him not being there it, it gives me the weirdest sensation like we're gonna go down and and like as though he's gonna be there i know and i still kind of can't really wrap my mind around that one the impermanence of something that was permanent also just doing this uh i i couldn't listen to the baseball thing i can't this um uh, like when fez's dad died i could be here for him i could be strong for him but i feel terrible today i can't be strong for you because that's my dad you yeah. know and when I just start to go, and this is like the first time I depended on my team to come through for me with some of this stuff because I just don't have it in me to do this show today. Yeah. Um, and that's like uh, a rarity. I have to also tell you this. So I'm in Boston and I get the call right before I go on stage. First, it's a text from my sister. She's like, are you home? I go, no, I'm in Boston. She's like, oh no, um, call me when you're done. I'm like, Bleh. so I call, I'm not going to call you when I'm done. And it's pretty much right before I go up and she's like, dad took a really bad spell. Mom's taking him to the ambulance right now. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be done here and then I'll, I'll, I'll head there and then I got some updates from your mom as we were going along and that wasn't good and then finally when the show was over I checked back in and we had done the meet and greet 
and then your mom just told me. And it hit me harder than I ever expected it to hit. And uh, the three guys there, the creeps, Bobby Kelly comes. He just gives me a bear hug. He's like, I know, man. And then Voss and Florentine took off and ran into the. <laughs> oh, God. And it's just that thing <laughs> this is of so different. some people, yeah. you know what I mean? It's in them to be supportive. And other people are like, I just want to distance myself yeah. from this. Both are fine reactions. Sure. You know what I mean? Flat footed is a reaction to have. It's not bad. And you shouldn't judge people by that. Um, look who's up on our line here. This is, uh, I think almost every time I've ever talked to my dad over the years, he checks in with me to see how Fez is going. Hey, Fezzy. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Gail. Hey, I'm so sad and so sorry to hear about this. Yeah. You know, he was very I fond of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I He always checked me, it, you, yeah. know, you know, and... That was so sweet. Even you know when I was being the biggest pain in the butt, he was he would still check on me. Yeah, and I always appreciated that. All right, we're I having trouble with your because uh, we're having trouble with your phone. We're going to call you right back, okay? Because you're breaking up. Okay. All right. Thanks. I right, get rid of him. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, but yeah, pop. Loved Fez. We got the biggest cat. First of all, he had never met anybody <laughs> like Fez before, and Fez would play it up. You know what I mean? Sure. And my father thought, like, even Fe Fez's anxieties were, like, hilarious to him. I remember, uh, guys, would you get Fez back on the line now? Thank you. Uh, I remember uh, the first time I had a... Um, a panic attack and it's when I um, quit drinking and I uh, took this moment to tell my dad I go I don't know I guess I felt like I was having a heart attack or mm -hmm. I guess uh, and I was like I guess it's like a stress thing or a pressure thing and my father said to me well shake that off <laughs> and that was the discussion we had and I'm like okay I will. <laughs> right <laughs> it's very weird you know when I I've been talking to my dad probably every Sunday for 38 years. Like yeah. the whole deal was, and never once did he call me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Never once did I get a call, hey, it's your dad. He would wait mm -hmm. until I called. And if I missed, I'd hear about it from my you know, mom or dad, like, hey, something up? You didn't check in with your dad this week. But, you know, the uh, the my mom was the one who lined that up. Really? Yeah, I mean, I was, um, it was only after I moved out that somehow my father was like, okay, so now I have no connection to him anymore. Is that it? Right, yeah. You know? Because when you, when you go for things, people always go through their mom first, right, you know, or like I'm going through this thing. Yeah. You're going to go to your mom first. That's one thing that you got to watch out when you're a father is like, you can end up just being the lecture guy or the punishment guy and then when you get to adulthood you have when your kid gets to adulthood he has no more connection with right you, you know when you're not in in need of that type of right. uh, stern guidance all right we got fezzy back hey fez hey sorry it's the last thing you people need is phone problems today yeah. well, so. that doesn't even make sense what you're talking about <laughs> um <laughs> Now, there, uh, I also want to say this. This is one of the reasons why my uh, dad always loved Fez is one time, uh, and it was pretty much, uh, I guess, when Fez was new to the game, right? Fez came in as like first an intern Fez and then like a low-level producer, you know? Right, yeah. I was bottom of the ladder, yeah. Yeah. And my dad was out to lunch with your Aunt Mishy and Fez. And I wasn't there, I don't think, or maybe I was. And Fez had said at the table, this was a, a good week. I got on the air twice. And my dad, lo you know, my dad loved that kind of six man. I want to do anything. I, I always try to say to our, <laughs> our, our guys, you don't realize how much I put you on the air compared to the way it used to, it used to be. It took you years yeah. to earn your way on to a show. Earl had probably Oh, yeah. Done... Once a week was it for yeah. the longest, for like the longest time. Yeah. And then you had to make that shine. 
Earl was on the on for for years before anyone said grab a mic yeah. for this, you know. But our guys just um you know, they're so focused on production and producing and stuff like that. But in the old days that was the only job that you had. Uh and I thought about you too, Fezzi, when um when your dad passed away. How how long ago was that now? Um, it's been eight years now. Eight years. Going on nine. Wow. Yeah. It feels like I know, it, it feels like happened. five minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, and I think about uh, that. Uh, Go ahead, Fez. I, I just wish I could tell you it gets better. Yeah, I know. That does not. That's something that doesn't. You just go on. I uh, think of that because Fez is always bringing his dad up to me. Like mm -hmm. every time that we talk, he'll like, oh, my dad would love this, or my dad would have got the biggest kick out of that. But we were, I mean, we were luckier than most. Yeah. Um, certainly uh, luckier than you'll ever be, Gail. You'll never keep me as long as you're around. <laughs> long as you're <laughs> well, you know, he really, he really, uh, like I said, because he was so interested in family history, he really bragged about being the oldest living male in his lineage. Oh, by the way, that was at like 61 that he yeah. broke that record. Men yeah. did not live, you know what I mean? Because they were well, all factory guys. Your um, dad was the first person I ever heard talk about genealogy like as a hobby. I mean, long before Ancestry.com came along. I yeah, know. that he kind of, you know, was interested in finding that stuff out and would go visit, you know, um, cemeteries to well, find out information about, you it, know, some second cousin or the, something. The reason why is my father's dad left when he was a baby he had never met his father and i think my dad was in his 30s when he gets a phone call from a woman who says um your dad has died and she was in mississippi and my father said to her well, he goes well you know i've never met my father before and um she goes, well, I, you know, I had married him, which I don't know if his dad had ever gotten a divorce in the first place. And, you know, we're going to lay him out and have a funeral. And my dad packed us all up. I think I was an infant at the time and drove to Jackson, Mississippi to meet this uh, woman and her family. And the first time that he saw his own father, he was in a coffin. He was laid out in a coffin. And he ended up befriending that woman and her family. And those people were the reason why I went into the carnival. It was Dora. Yeah. yeah. It was the reason why I went into the carnival when I was like 17. And my brother, you know, even before that, my brother years before, for many summers, my brother. And... um he had told me that story about the first time that he had saw his dad was in a coffin. And I said to him, when he told me this, I go, and I was in my early teens, I go, well, you should have pushed the box over. And uh, because I was so mad at yeah. this man that I had never met before. And my father said to me, what is wrong with you? Why, why would your mind even go there? You know, what a strange thing to say. <laughs> But, but when you I, did it with love, though. Yeah. So I know you. Yeah, know. I, I did it for whatever uh, <laughs> stupid defensiveness I had of him. But I had uh, met people through the carnival who knew my grandfather, and they were like, uh, "Oh, Whiskey Bob was a, was a was a great man." And I go, "Oh, was he? I wouldn't know that." You know what I mean? Right. Like I never, even with Dora, I could never give her even this because I just thought of my father. You know, abandon. Yeah. It's the weird thing that you do when you're a kid. And also, like, uh, it's interesting because just like you said that he, that led to his interest, he kind of always, uh, he always had that, you know, like that that stayed with him. You know, your childhood imprints upon you as an adult and even as an older person. It's unreal to me. I think about this time that we were all sitting around and we were playing one of those silly games, um, you know, where like, you know, you have a card and you're asking questions and yeah. so uh, personal questions. And I got to this one and it was like, what would you name your 
um, autobiography. What would you title yeah. it? Um, and it got to my pop, and he said, uh, "Little boy lost." And my mom was furious, <laughs> which I think was so funny. She goes, "Now you had a nice life," <laughs> which is so funny because it's true. He's like has this huge family, but it's it's remarkable that you kind of remember who you were as a child. And he was thinking about being a kid without a dad. This is twice during I, I, th this show that you've brought up my mom's anger, and I <laughs> hope it doesn't get back to her. Um, go ahead, Fezzi. I, I've been thinking about your dad ever since I got the news. And, you know, Gail, you were talking about his big family. I was thinking about him. He used to just beam when family was around. Sure. Yeah. He used to just, he, you know, uh, he would sit there and just take it all in and just love it. He would bask in it. Yeah. It was such an amazing guy. I remember one time we were, when Ronnie and I had first started at WNEW, we wanted to come up with something for the listeners and we were going to do the membership cards. And we had to come up with a name for what we would call the, the Ron and Fez show cards. And your dad was visiting in New York, and we were sitting around, and I had thrown out a couple of names and everything, and one of them was All Secret Society, ASS. And that just kind of hit his funny bone, and later on, we would go on, your mom had made dinner, and we later on, uh, TV, we were watching TV, and your dad would just go, all secret society <laughs> club. and i think he was actually the one who said why not call it the big ass club and that's what it became i love that this story came a great idea the fez it was really a salute to fez at the end of the day um but like we said we were lucky uh, you know to have my dad and and have uh, fez's dad for uh, them yeah. to see what we end up doing. Thanks for calling me, buddy. I appreciate Love it. Love you, Fezzy, so much. No, I'm going to go have a beer and a Carvel ice cream now. Mm, that way he would, he would love the thought of that. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, Gail had sent me a picture. It's up on our Instagram. I swear I'd never saw this picture before. But um, this is my dad from when I was, uh, I don't know, I must have been about somewhere around 9 or 10 when we used to take those trips to uh, Canada. And um, they are the things that everybody in my... It wasn't, wasn't just our family. It was also my aunt and uncle and our cousins, my uh, mm -hmm. grandparents, uh, um, Pop Watson, uh, Grandma Margie. We'd all go up there together. And it would just be us. There would be nothing close. And as you can see, it's like old school camping. Like there's... You would walk walls to the outhouse. There wouldn't be, you know... The shower you would wash up in the lake um but we were very uh lucky to have these memories because it's all we end up talking about now when we all get to uh get together um 844 rock god 844 rock god we'll take a couple calls um let's go to uh john in minnesota hey john Hey Gail, hey Ron. Hey buddy, I'm so I'm so sorry to hear the news. I I listen to you guys every day, and today I had a meeting, and so I just popped on <clears throat> right about two o'clock. And um, man, I'm 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 shook for both of you. Uh, I you know I lost my dad five years ago at age sixty six. I didn't get nearly enough time with him, and uh, just to hear you guys talking about celebrating the amount of time that you got with your father and your grandfather. It's just really special to me. Um, you guys have become, you know, you're, you're my family. You're my outlet uh, every day when I'm dealing with work and I'm getting people coming at me from every angle. I can still just put one headphone in and listen to you guys. You guys make me laugh, make me cry. Uh, so I'm just so sorry to hear. And, uh, Thank you, I wish buddy. you both the best. Thank you so much. And, I haven't talked to you in a while, so Gail, congratulations on your beautiful daughter as well. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Chris in uh, Canada. Chris. Hey, Chris. Hi. Um, I'm sorry for your loss, Ron. I can't even imagine. 
but when you were talking about uh, your dad giving out the uh, Comcast and him watching that much baseball, um, my dad moved to Canada from Paraguay when he was 16, didn't know any sports before, and uh, he absolutely fell in love with the Toronto Blue Jays and baseball. But living on the west coast of Canada, he never got to see baseball live ever. So for his 70th birthday, I surprised him and uh, took him down to the Seattle Mariners and Blue Jays series and absolutely blew his mind. And uh, he's 73 now, but he's not doing very well. And I just I just can't even imagine what you're going through. And I, it, yeah, it's something it, that we yeah. all do. And, and, you know, we all try to put it uh, out of our minds, but this is a finite game that we're playing. Yeah. You know? It's a finite game. You know, um, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> it's when my dad had uh, a couple of quick strokes and then a heart attack all at the same time. And he, uh, you know, it felt like we weren't going to keep him. And um, put the thing in the heart, whatever that is, the pacemaker yeah. type thing. So there was a decision of whether or not, you know, what to do. So I was driving down, it was in the winter, and uh, I was going to take the, I was going to take the angle that I wanted to make sure that my father got the quality of life um, that he would have wanted to, to have. Because like I said, he was 90, he was still going to work, he was still driving his own car, mm -hmm. um, he was driving a yellow convertible. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was going to very much take that angle of, uh, you know, since things were not going to be the same, um, that we should uh, maybe let him go. Uh, and so I sat down with my mom and, and we went over it. And, uh, and then she said to me, uh, I'm not ready to lose him. And I said, okay, you know, that's what we'll do. And um, since that happened, he was pretty much uh, housebound from that point on. <clears throat> but my mom did something that she had never done in her whole life. And I believe she's 88 years old. So this started at 86. She became a baseball fan, watched every Phillies game with him. And became an Eagles fan. The first season of the Eagles that she ever watched in her life <laughs> was the year they won the Super Bowl. And they would sit together on the couch watching these games and hold hands. And I, and I thought to myself, well, there's that quality of life that you were talking about. Even though life is very, very hard... You've found this thing to enjoy and discuss and to share and to share with your family. And it was totally unexpected. But the last couple of years of my life, my father uh, did not have a caretaker outside of my mom. And they are, were living in the house that he physically built. Who gets that? No. You know what I mean? Who gets that? There's so many things that we think about that makes life a uh, success. And for some reason, we don't even put as much on that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if my father ever had another girlfriend. I have never heard if he did or not. Um, and like I said, my mom was uh, 16 years old when they met. Yeah. And also, you know, he had taken that first spell and his uh, health had really been in question. I noticed every time I talked to him, he was talking about her. And he was kind of like talking like a teenager again. Almost gaga over her and... Uh, her looks and her spirit and uh 
They were like actually soulmates. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, my mom that. said that to me today, and she had never used that term. She goes, "He was my soulmate," and it made me laugh because I'm like, "Where did you get this term?" <laughs> I know. Um, it's funny, but uh, yeah, I mean, almost to say that it's like fairy tale love doesn't do it justice because it was so so real. You know? Yeah, it was their thing. Um, I. I'm going to find this the most difficult thing is I don't think I've ever said, you know, anything but mom and dad my whole life. Mom and dad said this, mom, you know what I mean? Like they really did have that thing where you they were uh, a partnership. Yeah. And uh, for me, and this is going to uh, probably sound like the, the, the wrong way because I don't even mean it as a compliment. My father did no wrong his whole life. He, for whatever this set of morals that he had, yeah. um, you didn't cheat somebody, you didn't, you know, you didn't do anything for money, family came first, all that stuff. And when I'm saying that well, my father did no wrong, I mean that when I say it. Now, I don't even mean that as a compliment because he had children who did. Mm -hmm. And it was impossible for him to understand why you would shortcut anything. Why would you have these kind of flaws? What are, what are you doing partying when you know that that's not... All that kind of stuff. But my father, and I, and I brought this up on the air to you, uh, before and I, I've said it to you. When I read to killing mockingbird i'm like atticus finch is my dad yeah. you know what i mean like i'm scout and he's atticus that book slayed me when i read it and by the way i've always had a little grudge against atticus you know what i mean i'm like a little rough on scout a little rough on yeah. the townspeople you gotta understand that the world isn't black and white it's very gray. he didn't have a he didn't have a gray thing about him he was very, very, uh, you know, do the right thing. Yeah. I remember you making that uh, comparison about him when you were talking about his work in the in the school board and just like his, uh, his fight and his moral code with that. Well, yeah, he would stick up for some not popular ideas here's a thing that i remember very well from being a kid and i was playing for um you know a youth football team called the chichester crusaders so i must have been like in eighth grade or something right and i'm at practice and there was this thing they were going to put another factory uh right next to our neighborhood and uh Anyone who knows, you know, uh, that place, it's uh, kind of a factory town. And he was uh, leading this thing, or he was involved in this thing to stop it. And one of the things uh, about where I lived, there literally was a train track um, between the white neighborhood and the black neighborhood. And most of the people that were part of this against this factory were from the black neighborhood that it was going to be right up against. And not only was there pollution, but there was a danger of all this gas being stored and if one of those things went up. So I remember when I, uh, I finish uh, my practice, I go home, I shower, and then I run over to this school where they were going to have this uh, kind of town hall meeting about it. And I come in, and, and the only reason why I remember I was practicing, because my hair was still wet, and I was standing in the back. And it was my father, and it might have been a black minister, but somebody like that that was a, a leader of the black community and had that old school way of being. Standing up to not only these lawyers and stuff from this company, but also politicians that were in for, you know, the money that was going to roll through the town. And I was watching my, ma my dad 
you know, talk and debate and it's going back and forth. And they had made the point, why would you care that you uh, were putting another one in? There's already one on the other side. And he said, just because you have a pig farm on one side, there's not, you don't want a pig farm on the other side of your house. And the room was erupting like people do at those town hall things. And I was sitting there and I'm watching him. And again, this is, I'm at the age where you're having, you're disconnected from your dad. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like you're not agreeing on a lot of things. And I remember thinking, because he was so powerful in this, oh, he could have done anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's here for us. You know what I mean? And I remember thinking, he's an extraordinary man living an ordinary life because he valued family over regular ambition. But he was as good as anybody in that meeting. And it really made me even feel like a little guilty. Like, are, are, have we held him back from what he, you know, should have been? And I've always had that feeling. I never said it to him because that's, it wouldn't even dawn on him. He doesn't understand that kind of ambition. And again, that's why it also wasn't the easiest thing to be his kid. It wasn't easy to be his son. And it wasn't easy to be his daughters because he was also part of the old patriarchy. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, um, my sisters always live closest and we're the most dedicated, but he always was thinking about me and my brother first. You know, it used to hurt their feelings. Right. But that was a different, you know, it was a different world, different time. Sorry about that. I got lost in that story. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we're talking about my dad. My dad passed away over the weekend. And uh, Gail and I are going to do this show, and then we're going to uh, go down and be with family the rest of the week. Um, there's another part of this story that blows me away. So my parents have had our funeral, their funeral plots since... Probably my whole life, you know, it's where my grandparents are buried, my great grandmother, my dad's grandmother, they're all in these in these plots in this place. And a couple of years no, it must have been like seven or eight years ago. My mom said, I don't know if your dad and I want to go to those plots. We're gonna look at another place. I'm like, Oh, really? She goes, Well, you know, it's far away and people aren't visiting there. Whatever it's, you know. So, we're going to go look at this other place. And then she calls me. <laughs> Again, I don't have any opinion. She's like, you know what? I don't like, really like that cemetery. It's closer, but it's kind of run down. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. You know. Never think of it again. This is like seven years ago. So, I'm talking to her the other night. And she goes... Look, I don't know how you're going to tell the take this, but um, everyone else seems to be okay. Um, your dad and I decided we wanted to be cremated. She goes, I want to keep him with me, and then we'll, you know, and I'll be cremated. And I, I don't know, maybe we'll buy one of those walls that you could stick us in. So I'm like, whoa. I mean, we're, we're Catholic, and years ago you couldn't do that. My whole life you couldn't do it, but I yeah. think the Catholics are okay with it now. And I'm like, I'm stunned. She goes, I don't want him to be far away from me, and I don't. She goes, you guys are never going to go to that cemetery. I go, I don't think I've ever been to that cemetery. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't go and visit my grandmother's thing. Like, they grew up in a time where every Sunday you went out to the cemetery. Um, but I was very stunned. Yeah, it was to hear shocking. That. Yeah. It was shocking to hear that. It but one hundred percent of the people went, Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh it's so funny too, I, like uh that she felt like she's 
this is a decision. I'm going to run it by everybody. I know. But, uh, but they made said, that decision without telling us. I know. That's funny. I, you know, I know. Thinking, I'm not going to take their shit. You yeah. Know? It's really, really cute. But it was it was shocking just because it seemed so off brand. Yeah. You know? Um, but the, the reasoning behind it um, was beyond, like, hearing that. That um, she doesn't want them to be a part. I got texts from a lot of people. I didn't even notice that. Oh, that's really nice. Mm, I there's one from Hope. I'm just going to text thanks to people. That'll be my thing. <laughs> I heard from everybody but Earl. Is that true? Yeah. I just can't put the words. Oh, that's really sweet, Earl. Uh, you okay, buddy? Earl went down. He's he's down. Sit he's up, really, Earl. He's really crying, poor thing. That's something Chris and Vito didn't do. Yeah. Well, now he, he can't get up. Well, I contacted you, what? Earl. Yeah, I pal. I'm sorry. I didn't think you would go down. Did you even meet my dad? No, but but, but when you wake, I ache. Oh. oh, that's really sweet. That reminds me of something. So years ago, my sister got him. I think she even got a little tiny dog. I don't even know what that dog is. Do you know the make of this dog? Is it, is the yeah, make it's the a Yorkie. Word? It's like a Yorkie Chihuahua mix. My, my father was like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? That little thing has not been away from my father for a second. No. All obsessed, these years. Obsessed with him. And then my mom said the ba the, she thinks that the dog knows. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God. Because that dog wouldn't even want me to leave the house. Try, would try to keep me in the house to be next to him. Yeah. Because she knew that it made him good. Or if he would get up, she would run and find my mom. Look who it is. It's Hard Rock Johnny. Hey, Johnny. Hello, Bennington. Hey. Sorry for your loss for the both of you. It's, uh, and thanks for doing the show. It kind of helps those of us who've walked down that path already. Like, it would be 10 years that I lost my dad. It's... You know, like you said, everyone's going to go through it. doesn't make it any better or easier, but sometimes hearing other people talk about stuff like that helps. So thanks. Thank you, buddy. And you didn't even... Did you ever get to bury your dad with his original heart? <laughs> no, no. It was See, that would always bother me. <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to that first heart. I don't know what they do with that. They ate it with a little fava beans. <laughs> <laughs> a nice bottle of candy. <laughs> uh, Dr. Oz still has it, maybe. I don't know. Dr. Oz is the one who operated him? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Oz, before he was TV's Dr. Oz, did wow. have his heart transplant, which Exciting. was kind of cool. The weird thing is, I think I would have trusted him more then oh, than 100%. today. If someone oh, told yeah, me ab Dr. Oz is doing I'd anything to me, I'd be like, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was a long time before he was. It's, that was let's see, six, ten, twenty, God, over twenty years ago, probably for the heart transplant. So, so he was a young Doctor Oz. All right. Well, thank you, Johnny. Love Appreciate you, Johnny. It, buddy. Love you guys. Hang in there. Right. Peace. Uh, I'm going to take uh, a break here. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, we'll be uh, back. Um, eight four four Rock God. Eight four four Rock God. It is. Um, this is the only show we're going to do this week, and then uh, we're off to have a funeral for my dad. Um, it keeps. Again, I prepared myself so much for this that I didn't. For I, I thought I would be a little more stoic about it, um, but you know, I'm trying not to judge myself. It, it is what it is, but it really does uh, hit in waves. Oh, there's Bobby. Uh, I had such a great time with the creeps yeah. that weekend. I'm always going to remember this. Let's go to Robert Kelly. Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Hey, guys. I'm so sorry. Dude, let me just say this. First of all, Friday, Friday night, Long Island, 
and then Saturday night, your hometown in Boston. Uh, it was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. That Boston audience, no wonder there's so many great comics that come out of there, but they're just, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. And there's such regular kind of street people. Everyone yeah. we met <laughs> was the Boston people you want them to meet. But I, I, yeah. I, I don't know whether you're aware, aware of this, Bobby, but I was getting calls throughout the show and I was trying to keep it together until the end before I finally knew that I lost my dad. But you were so sweet the way you came over and gave me a bear hug. I'll never forget that. But I don't know whether you know this. Voss and Florentine all both ran <laughs> as far away as they possibly could. <laughs> they didn't... They didn't they didn't give you a, like a handshake? Like no, a, a I, I had to go into the green room to say, okay, guys, I'm leaving, and they gave me a handshake, <laughs> and I'm sorry. Neither made eye contact. <laughs> but they, they were like, <laughs> because I was a little emotional, but they treated it like they walked in on someone having diarrhea. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh well, at, least, at least we know it's not like they're not faking being disconnected assholes. No, I mean, no, no, it's, it's real. real. Yeah. yeah, it's real. <laughs> well... <laughs> Oh, so I can't believe, first of all, I, you know, this month coming up, I lost my dad last year. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the fact, you know, the fact that you did, I, I, I mean, you couldn't even, dude, you were so funny backstage in the thing. I mean, a, any second, we had the camera girl there too, and she was filming every single second of it, and it's, you were killing me. And the, the panel was fucking I mean, the best one we've done so far, I think. I yeah, so oh, much. by far. And then the, the meet and greet was fucking great, and the fans were great. I couldn't, and then when Deb told us, we, I was like, what the fuck? I mean, dude, you, you're a fucking, you're a goddamn man. I would have I would have fucking, I would have well, left. You know, I, I literally had this stupid thing right, right before I went on stage. My dad uh, didn't value anything more than work and he really believed that you were supposed to you know I'm like he was a, a work person and he never I don't ever remember him missing a day I mean we saw him two fishing trips a year and that was it basically yeah. so I'm like saying to myself you know when I'm getting uh, you know calls like this isn't looking good I literally said well look I know that he would say kill it you know what I mean? Go out there and really go after it. So that was like this little weird tribute that means nothing to anybody but me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was a way well, for me to think about him. That's good. I mean, listen, man. You know, I mean, I remember I found out my dad, Pat, my dad was, so I got that same phone call. I literally got into the hotel, put my bag down. I got a face cloth from the bathroom to master base. Mm. And I got a phone call. You got to come home. And I, I was like, I was like, I don't even know what to do. I sat there and I had, a, I had to have the club owner tell me what to do. Yeah. Because I was like, I don't. Do I go home? Do I do? I like, I, I didn't understand. Like what? And it was like go. And he put me on a plane. He put me in the thing. The guy up in Rochester, great guy. But you know, for you to, I mean, and you, mur I mean, I don't know how to say this to blow smoke in your ass, Ronnie. You're fucking murdering. I mean, it's so amazing to watch you go out there and do comedy because it's such a subtle, to, to be subtle and kill the way you kill, and especially that night, Friday and Saturday, it's like crazy, man. I mean, that show was my favorite show, and I know that you're going through all that stuff underneath that. I don't know if there could be a better tribute to your father than to, to do that type of show that caliber and, 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 and you know, uh, unbelievable, you know, and you met, you did an hour and a half meet and greet. Yeah. You met every single fan that was in line. And there was, that was the biggest meet and greet we did. There was a line in and around the whole theater. Yeah. It was, um, it was, I, I'm not kidding when I say this and, uh, Bobby probably understands that stand up comedy is probably not, what you would consider a team sport, but this show that we have, you're very proud of each person's set, yeah. and then you're proud the way we come together at the panel, and that's why, to me, like I'm as happy 
for you know Bobby said as I am my own you know yeah. what I mean I'm happy for the way Voss starts it off and I know okay he's in a good mood he's gonna have that set that he wants to have Florentine comes up you know what I mean like it's like running a relay race and we try to have a really big lead before we yeah. give <laughs> to Bobby which puts you know yeah. pressure on Bobby you know what I mean like Bobby could only lose the race that's the only thing <laughs> we leave him with you know we, but it, it's not competing against each other it's competing yeah. against our show yeah. that we did before so we're doing uh, Red Bank this week and I'm definitely going to be there and yeah. then the the next night we're going to be in Staten Island I'm definitely going to be there yeah. you know and my family totally. I talked to my mom and my sisters they want me to be there you know what yeah. I mean they're all excited that I'm doing this tour my dad was very excited I'm doing this tour you know it means a lot to them well, you know my agent called me today and he said you know I do a lot of these tours and he goes I'm glad you guys you guys are finally doing it right and I was like, what do you mean? He goes, because you're having fun. You're having a good time with each other. He goes, I'm watching all the Instagram stuff, all the stuff you guys are doing before, on the way to the gig, after the gig, during the gig. You guys are thoroughly enjoying each other's uh, comedy and, and time together. And that's what comedy tours should be. It shouldn't be who's the best or who's the more famous. or who's. The you should be having a fucking blast. Yeah doing this because we get to tell fucking jokes and have fun with each other for a living. And, and this tour is exactly what I expected it to be. You know, even the bickering between me and dummy and, you know, and, 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 and fucking Florentine, who cares? You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, every girl that walks by big, fat, old and small, would you do her? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, but, it's the funnest uh, thing I've ever done. Uh, Bobby has this, uh, gorgeous young girl come in and she's going to shoot the show backstage her name is paris and uh we've seen some of this stuff she works she travels with god smack we saw she's really really talented and then Flo and uh, oh, you know florentine could be her dad and then florentine's like you know i was just saying like for instance would your boyfriend say to you and you're just like why are you oh, fishing no. to oh, see no. if she has a boyfriend why can't we just be here just enjoy her as a professional right. because by the way she is literally an artist yeah. right she's an artist herself <laughs> and he's trolling her you know what i mean <laughs> Ron, you know how fat Ron is. Like, what? There's three people as fast as Ron in the business. He's just the fastest. As soon as it comes out of his mouth, he's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my Ron god! Her, I just was asking her a question. He's like, "No, you're not. This is. Do you know what year it is? You can't." Well. Oh, it's so funny, dude. Fucking <laughs> Florentine. Oh shit, man! I got all that footage from. She actually already edited everything together, Ron. Oh, she and was great. Me and you with Voss backstage telling him he's the worst actor of all comedians. Yes. And, and then he yeah. went into Shakespeare, I think. It's, yes. It's one of the funniest. The Tempest. Oh, my God. And then, <laughs> then we're like, no, well, you're the best. <laughs> but but then, it, and then we, we did the mass blocking of San Roberts from stage. Yeah. Perfect. You know, um, this was yeah. weird. Do you remember when Voss was singing the Cat Stevens song? And it yeah, was father and son, right? That. Yeah. Now yeah. this is the f weird thing. So Voss is gone. I can sing both parts, the f you know, and I go, "It's the same guy." It's Cat <laughs> Stevens. <laughs> so he's singing. Do you know the song? I'm I do. About? Yeah. Here's the dumbest thing. One time when I was a kid, I tried to play that song for my father, and he was like, um, "These and, and I like it was a father son thing." And he goes, "These assholes just try to screw your head up. They don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he wanted to have." No, nothing to yeah. do with. Hey, we both see things differently, but it doesn't mean <laughs> either one of us is wrong. He slapped it back in my face like I just came in with a condom in my mouth, like a puppy. <laughs> I mean, I felt so effeminate when I said it. <laughs> ah, shit, man. But I, I, I want to say two things, to you Bobby. Number one, thank you for how kind you were the other night. But two, thank you. For you and your team putting this tour together, because we are playing these. I mean, we've done four so far. These theaters are all different. They're all amazing. Long Island was the, you know, place that Billy Joel just played a couple of years ago when we're in Long Island and we're playing that room and killing it and having fun. 
Then we go to Boston to the Wilbur. It's yeah. gorgeous. Killing it and having fun. Every one of these theaters is all you could hope for. You know what I mean? All. Yeah, it is. And I'm glad the fans are so great and they're coming and they're so, you know, they, lo I love that they love all of us. You know what yes. I mean? It's, they're coming out, but like, that was the, the, the best show we've seen, which is exactly what we thought it was going to be. Right. And it, and it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm so happy we got, you know, what are we Friday night? Where are we? Staten Friday night, we're at Red Bank in, New, yeah. in New Jersey, which again, is this a historic great yeah. theater? And then uh, Saturday is St. George in uh, Staten Island, in which Staten is, Island. you know, it's a mind blowing. Yeah, beautiful theater, theater too. Um, yeah, and I was thinking maybe we could even see if any of the New York comics want to stop in Staten Island. If there's anybody around that would love just to go out and do that big theater, because we're having a ball with it. We really are. Yeah. And I uh, think, uh, yeah, I think uh, was well, shoot. I think Sal's getting married. Sal Volcano. Oh, I think he day. was keeping that quiet. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not marrying a guy. Uh, no, 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 he's not marrying a guy. But he has like crazy fans, you know. Oh, okay, but yeah. not in. He's not. I don't think it's in that. Island. I think I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Cross the street. But here's the deal. If, yeah. If, yeah, you definitely. If there's comics around or whatever, just make sure you're good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But we, we don't want, want we, yeah. We don't want an uh, yeah open mic from San Antonio showing up. <laughs> well, I know get out of there. He's pretty good. <laughs> you, know, you know what? If he does show up, you can go on. Let him go on. Uh, but uh, you are uh, uh, you're amazing, Bobby. It's so uh, I mean, it's one of the pleasures of my life to be doing this stuff with you. It's just really great. Buddy, I'm a fan. Is, I honestly you're, am. You're, I'm a. I'm, I'm telling you, dude. It's like it's like having the the Godfather. Knowing you're on the show with us and, and killing it and everybody. The, when fan pop you get when you walk out, it makes me smile every time. It's fucking, when they say your name and you walk out there, it's so funny, dude. It's so fucking funny. And, and it's, it's, it's just like you're fucking Elvis Presley. That, that's it really is. <laughs> it's crazy. Did you hear what I, I said about you the other day on stage? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right, well, I, <laughs> I kind of made fun of you a little bit. I hope you don't get mad. No, that's all right. I have it coming. Do, do you know that Voss was so upset? He thought that I was real, being real because remember how you and uh, Florentine were saying to me, I can't believe this is the joke he does before yeah. you, you know, come up. Mm -hmm. So I kind of make fun of that joke and, uh, you know, I have some fun teasing him. Yeah. And then I come off stage like 20 some minutes later. He's like, Really? I, I would never do anything. I don't go, no, you know, I'm joking. <laughs> it was well, literally based on what Florida and Bobby was saying to me. Well, because you're the, you're the first one, thank God. You started, you, you wrote you wrote this amazing joke about the tour name. Which oh, yeah. Hilarious. I, when you did it, I was like, what the fuck? That's so funny. Yeah. So I went up the other night and I, I Voss brought me off. I go, Voss. I go, Ron is the only person who at least dresses like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I go, Fucking, like I said, Voss and Florentine both from the neck down look like children in the mall. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They and then, do. And then I go, I, but I said, I go, but Ron, I go, geez, I, I said, you're the uh, Mick Mars of the tour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, I, go, if, I go, we move slow to the microphone, that's all. <laughs> I, I, I would just say this, just the fact that you think that Motley Crue is cool. Let's just know what <laughs> <laughs> Two different worlds that we're from. <laughs> uh, all right. Talk to you soon, buddy. Right, love you, Peace. Bobby. I love you. Peace. Take care, guys. I love you so much. Have a good one. Uh, Bobby Kelly. Uh, it's going to be the Creeps. Uh, we will be at the Red Bank. Come out and see us. And then uh, we're going to be at Staten Island to St. George on Saturday. These shows are as good as they get. I'm not even... I, I know it sounds insane when you're in the show to say that. Even if I wasn't in the show, it yeah. would be great. But with me in that show, fuck. <laughs> so good. We'll be right back. Bennington. It's the Bennington Show. <clears throat> We're back. And uh, if you're just tuning in, we've been talking about uh, my pop, who uh, we just lost this last weekend. And uh, taking the time to talk about what an incredible man he was, how much he meant to me, to my family, 
what a good father he was and uh how much we're gonna miss him <clears throat> and we didn't expect george harrison to kick us no kicked you know. us right in the chest that might be the truest song yeah. ever written it might be the best religious song ever you know but that receipt that we get uh for life you know what i mean has to be paid for everybody you know and yeah. the uh receipt that comes from good experiences is uh it hurts when they're over yeah i know like um a lot of times i've reflected on just how lucky i am uh to have the people in my life um people like my pop who i've had around my whole life and have lived long full lives and that feeling of knowing like at some point like something's gonna come for you and and you're gonna be heartbroken and you just have to accept that that's why you get the good you know yeah. that you you kind of have to have it you know uh, my dad got a, a big kick out of you and i working together and um out of his four kids he had worked with three of them at one point or another he uh he brought my brother into the factory um and then he opened up a, like a beauty shop with the, my younger sister and then my older sister works for the church and they both worked in the, the same office but i remember being a kid and my uh, brother told me about my dad at work and he was like, oh, I don't know, man. Some days he, you know, he lights in. Yeah. And there was something, because it was the plastic business, and my father was in f uh, charge of quality control, and they were sending stuff out that he thought was shit, you know? And instead, he would just take it and smash it against the wall so it couldn't be done. And my brother said, these guys are furious. And then my brother and somebody else had to stand behind my dad like, this shit's <laughs> on. You know what I mean? Like why everything down there has to be taken to that point right. you know you just at work together sure but um that kind of stuff i remember the first time uh that my father took me into a plant uh where he worked it was some kind of you know bring a kid to work day and there was these big giant extruders these big machines that wouldn't be more and it was so loud in that place and it was so crazy and my dad was going around checking on things and i'm like Oh, I never want to work in a plant. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I just do not like this at all. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, that's how come I, I ended up going in the direction I went. But my friend Smitty ended up working for my dad too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, for a while. It's a very weird uh, thing that you have a family life and then you have a work life and you divide them and then at one point they start to come together when it was like oh so that's who you are here you yeah know? but you're right he did um he did really get a kick out of the fact that the two of us were working together and he would always say to me how's the show yeah and i would say yeah it's going great and he goes like this they appreciating you there <laughs> and I told him I was doing this tour with the creeps and he's like, That doesn't get in the way of the show, does it? You know what I mean? <laughs> and he would always be like, So how do these people know that you're coming to Boston or Pittsburgh? You know, yeah. always go, I say it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're picking it up there. The whole yeah. idea of satellite was so odd to him. <laughs> It was that other show you used to do. It was very popular. <laughs> you ever talked to any of those fellas again? You know, we would talk about the yeah. Ron and Ron show in Florida. Sure. I remember the first time I hit in radio. I mean, it sounds stupid that your son's on the radio, right? So he comes down. Him and my mom are coming down. And I had to do an appearance at an air show. And you were a little girl. And yeah. I go, let's all... I go, I got to go to this air show. Why don't we all go and we'll see these old airplanes Remember and people it. are flying in and out. And it was over at uh, MacDill Air Force Base or someplace like that. So we get there and I had to do like a meet and greet, right? I was just as the Ron and Ron show was taking off. And um, we go there and I was going to have to do that for an hour and then we go enjoy the air show. 
and there was just tons of people lined up, you know, to meet this new morning show that had been hitting. And my parents saw me for the first time of people who wanted <laughs> my autograph or whatever, you know. I don't even think we were doing many pictures then because, we, you know, you didn't have the phones. And I just saw this look of, what? <laughs> Why would anyone care about meeting you? And it was very, very funny to me, you know. It was a very, very funny thing to go through. And, then, and people were saying stuff like, you must think that he's so... And them just like, yeah, I guess. I guess. You know I mean, I guess some of this stuff. I remember even when I was um, a kid, um, the high school yearbook said that I was a class clown, right? And my parents didn't say anything to me about it. And um, they called up my cousin and they were like, funny what is he saying that's so funny what is he doing and she's like no he's you know he's a very funny guy everyone gets a kick out of him and she goes i don't know what you mean you mean because <laughs> i you know i lived a double life with my family right you know <laughs> so they could not imagine they didn't think any of this stuff was funny they used to say stop it you're really making an ass out of yourself <laughs> I honestly always think that there's a a thing in a in a family where the men are more worried that the youngest boy is tough enough. You know what I mean? Like they're all like, "Hey, yeah. yeah," you know. Like the women in my family, they were just enormous amount of unconditional love, but the men were always like, "Well, oh, look at this. You got no kind of punching. Look, look how easy it is to punch you." You know what I mean? Like. You had to live, they were just like, I know, when you leave here, I want you to be able to take care of yourself. You know, yeah. I think they were all concerned about that. Isn't that funny, the way that men do that to counterbalance motherhood? Because motherhood is so yeah. unconditional, and motherhood is like, you're my baby forever. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, it's my job to balance this out. Well, I remember having, you know, I had my mom who, you know, that was number one for me. You know, my older sister, she was like junior mom. Mm -hmm. uh, I had three grandmothers. I had two grandmothers and a great grandmother. My aunt was also my godmother. I had girl cousins. They all loved me so much that I thought that was the way the world was. Right. You know what I mean? Like I would be sitting there and like, look at him just sitting up. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'd be like, yeah, I'm sitting here. And they're like, look at him drinking his milk. Looks like a little gentleman drinking milk. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm drinking my milk. It's all happening, you know? <laughs> look at his hair. He should be a hair model. He should model his hair places. The women are going to be all over him. And I would just be basking in that kind of love as they're, yeah. you know, getting me drinks and giving me food and, you know. And then I would walk down the hall, my grandfather, my uncles, my big brother, my dad, they're like, eh, look at him. he's got nothing, look at him, what do you do, kiss the boys at school? You know what I mean, like, <laughs> you know, what do they call you, Sally? And you know, you're in there boxing against people, you know, because they were just concerned, you know, that somebody, you know, anybody picks on you, you better hit them with everything, you know. And that was the way of the world back then. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's funny too. We were talking about that that difference of uh, the way my pop was with as a grandfather versus a father, and I always think about how you said like that you were getting like you know nitpicked on the way you were sitting and like you oh, like yeah. the manners and everything like that, and uh, and he's you know kind of gave nothing but warmth and openness to his grandkids <laughs> but you know the other funny thing about him and my mom is like they never like went contrary to our parenting or anything you know what i mean yeah and that was always like a lesson for me that you don't come in and go what are you doing letting her do you know yeah they, like they never they were like well you're the parent yeah but that that thing of being able to come in and have fun meant that they had an okay feeling that you're going to right. be okay with the kids right exactly that there was trust there that's interesting i guess i hadn't really thought about that i think that, about that all the time that you know you um you learn to be a, a grandparent from them well, because the, the, i was thinking too of 
how much I think about learning to be an adult child to a parent from your relationship with Pop, you know? Well, I always thought this, like, when you get to see your parents as people, you know what I mean? Yeah. It is a, a kind of, oh, okay, I get it. Now I don't have to. Like, I always, I hate when guys are like, I want to show my dad that I'm the best salesman. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like, who? Stop it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. when you get to that point where you're like, I don't have to go back and show them something. Yeah. Or it doesn't matter if somebody missed a ball game or what. You know, just stop it. Yeah. Cut it out. I mean, if there's anything about that, all things must pass, it is passing. Yeah. That's why that song is so beautiful that you better get it, not just in the in the times when somebody passes, but you better get it when they're driving you crazy. You know, and I, I would never want anyone to think like, uh, oh, Ron idolized his dad. I did when I was younger. You know what I mean? I did like, oh, this is something, you know. But then as I got older, I'm like, okay, he's a d dude who, by the way, didn't have a dad. You know what I mean? So maybe that's why he wasn't as whatever is, you know, hurts my feelings about. You got to do that when you have an older brother, a younger brother, you know, with your sisters. You got to stop. Yeah. I uh, said this earlier. I can't believe now that I'm like Chris and Vito and I don't have a dad. Because I've been teasing these guys about me being, you know, because I'm so much older than them. And yeah. I have a father. But I am brokenhearted to join that club. And even so much more brokenhearted for Chris and Vito that they never got to this point. Yeah. I'm sure Chris's dad never saw him do any of the things. No. He died 15 years ago. Right. Way before, like, I was still in college. So yeah, you know, I never like. In, he never got to see you as a man. He never got. No, you know. No, not at all. And uh, yeah, and it, it, it's and he, like when he went, like it was on bad terms with everyone. Yeah. Like it, like he he died in the streets, so it was like he, he like burned bridges and shit. No, there is uh, another thing. Is like there were times in my life that I was not the best son, and I'm sure there was some that he wasn't the best dad and i've had friends that lost their dad during those you know rebellious years you know i'm just glad that you know i yeah. got past that yeah that's lucky also i have to say this getting sober helped me see some of the things for what they are too only because that's part of the thing putting everything like your relationship with your dad into Real, perspective yeah it just gives you a chance to put it in a different perspective yeah. rather than blame or shame you know what i mean yeah like when we're normal we're either blaming people or feeling bad about our own behavior and i've done you know i've come up short with my children i've come up short with my friends my wife my co-workers i you know it's been pointed out to me i'm not the easiest person to work with Sometimes I think these things, you know what I mean? You have to learn from those things. Yeah, and I think also it's weird when you um, when you can finally get perspective of your parents and it, it does both things, right? Like if you say, man, this is a choice that my dad did made for me and I want to be different. And then you can yeah. look at something and go, man, they were that that same person was so much better at this kind of thing. Right. You know what I mean? You can't, um, even if there were things that you felt wrong about, you've got a balance between those two. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're if you still rebelling against your uh, parents as an, an adult, you know, it's it, you have to kind of find some way to reflect on it. Right. Find some kind of balance and, and see what you can take from it, the lessons you learn. Because it is, it's wild when you, you kind of figure out that your parents are just people. It's also, you know, it's it's got to be a wonderful thing to know that you live the kind of life that it's going to leave a vacuum when you're gone. You know what I mean? And like you don't want to be, thank God that bastard's gone. You know what I mean? Again, none of these things have to do with the normal kind of American success that we talk about. But... They are some of the truest things. Vito, how old were you 
when you lost your father? Uh, I was I was about four years old. You got your mic has to be on, son. I was about four years old. So you don't even remember your dad. You no. just saw pictures. Yeah, I just saw pictures. I remember like very few memories, like because uh, he had cancer at the time. Yeah. So I just remember him like uh, on a couch, uh, like playing uh, Mario, and like I would get called in to talk to him sometimes. He left me like a car. You were playing Mario or him? Him. He was playing Mario. And he turned man. <laughs> yeah, um, but do you think do you ever think like oh what would happen if my dad would have lived how would our my lives been different yeah all the time because like we um we moved back to manhattan after my dad passed away so my entire life would be different you would have been a suburban kid yeah a guido if you will yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could have been on the jersey shore i think that would have been my still life could. i don't think he's too old for that <laughs> <laughs> i saw an article today 41% of the world population is under 24 years old. That's, that's really... That's, they're coming for us. Yeah, kids. they're coming. <laughs> yeah. And they're On mad TikTok. what we've yeah. done to the environment. Oh, so, they are. Yeah. They said um, the only meat they want to eat is boomer burgers. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is... Here's something that uh, we didn't think about. It's like, you know how we were always talking about the, the robot uprising? Yeah. The war against the machines. Yeah. What if it's just like the youth and the machines are together? It's like they use them against us. That's terrifying. They build them and they say, here's the problem. The drone army. It's like a child uh, robot army. Hey, uh, let's go over here to, uh, to uh, Michael in Florida. Hi, guys. First off, my condolences. I uh, lost my father. At 61 years old, he was 61. And one of the things that really got me through was the fact that he and I were really close. So uh, it was an unfortunate accident, but he wasn't sick. But we were close, and I didn't have any regrets after he passed. But I just want to tell you one thing that a partner of mine got from his son as a birthday card. And the card said, Dad, when I was... Ken, I thought you were the smartest man in the world. When I turned 20, I thought you were the dumbest man in the world. Now that I'm 45, I now think you're the smartest man in the world. Yeah, and what you yeah. want to make sure is like that uh, relationship doesn't end at age 20. Of course, that's what happened to Chris. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> Do you have any uh, regrets that anything you ever said to your dad? Oh, or? oh t tons. Because like, uh, you know, Towards the end, when things got really bad and my mom kicked him out, I was just very angry with him. And, like, I just, like, had no, I didn't care that he was all fucked up, like, mentally and, you know, he was an addict. And, right. like, and I just judged the fuck out of him because I was just angry because he made my mom sad and he was, you know, my opinion at that, that time, a bad father. But, you know, I, 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 looking back on it, like, the guy was just fucked up and he didn't get the help he needed right and exactly he's really you, sad that is exactly <laughs> right that if you can look at him like he's a person like oh he was a sick yeah. person he had problems because and you don't realize this as a child father isn't your only role to any man you know what i mean you yeah. are you think yeah. to yourself you might even rank that as highest but it doesn't mean that's all you are and when you're a child you're just like I remember seeing people without kids and feeling bad for them. Yeah. Like I would have neighbors without children. I go, what a sad life they're having. You know, <laughs> they don't have no a joy like, like me. <laughs> somebody would move in to a neighborhood without children and you're like, oh my God, that's horrifying <laughs> for them. And now I go, what a great life. You yeah. know what I mean? They're out there. They were enjoying. Because Spending your you, money. <laughs> you think things are, oh, you know, I was just talking to my mom today. This is how much the world has changed. She was 16 when she had met my dad. And like basically right away, he started courting her mm -hmm. along with another friend of his. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like they were just like, you know, what a, what a hot young jitterbug. And she goes, my heart was beating so fast. She doesn't realize that that, that could happen 50 times to you, 100 times. But back then it was like, you're 16. You're like, who am I going to pick? Right. Who am I going to spend the rest of my life with? Yeah, you know, this was the '40s that they met. Right, and uh, yeah, that that uh, that decision was forever. In right, 
And my mom dedicated herself to family. She was dedicated to her children. She was a homemaker. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the last years, uh, she became the caretaker of my dad with no one else involved, no outside things. Mm -hmm. It's stunning when you think about it. Yeah. Um, her Her strength through this has been unreal and I think uh, it's been everybody's focus kind of thinking about how much she's gonna miss him and uh, how how strange it is to s think of them not side by side I mean even when yeah I spoke to her you know she was um, she corrected herself because she kept saying she kept saying we yeah. and um yeah, I mean that that was her whole life. Yes. Her whole adult life, teen year, I mean it's crazy right. to think, you know, when you say somebody's been married 72 years, that doesn't even sound like the yeah, length like of a marriage. <laughs> it doesn't sound. Is that when we throw it to something yeah. or where we're done? Okay. Um, I can't believe how fast this show when I can't, I do, honestly don't even remember any of it today. So I thank uh, everybody for understanding. I've heard so many nice things from friends and people are saying, can I send flowers? We're not doing flowers. And they, as far as I know, they're not setting up any donations to, you know, the kind words that people have said on social media. Uh, it's nice. Come out and see the creeps would be a nice thing. Come see our Thanksgiving show if uh, if you're in New York City. That's going to be a lot of fun. And Chris is going to, you know, we're still in the middle of doing a bunch of stuff. And Chris mm -hmm. is going to handle all of that yeah. this week. Um, yes. Today you are a man, Chris Stanley. Today you are a man. Thank you. Um, uh, Eastside Dave just uh, wrote to me. Um, very, very sweet things. And Dave is going to be at the Red Bank on... Uh, oh, that's I'm great. trying to work it out where he brings out the show and stuff. But, you know... Um, come see us there. Come see us at Staten Island. It'll be a lot of fun to see folks. I'm not... I mean, I'm devastated uh, for my family this week. But I totally get it. I'm totally a thankful person. I'm a grateful for person that I've had these experiences. Like I said, I've just pointed out folks this close to me. You know what I mean? That didn't get the lucky, you know, luck of the draw. Look how many people I know that aren't even around to see their grandchildren. You know what I mean? I have so many friends. Yeah. But we'll never get to this point. I had friends come out. Look, this is a, a, a crazy thing. When I was in Reading on this tour, Wardy and Rap came out to see me. These are friends of mine that I grew up with. A couple of months ago, they went and saw my uh, went and visited my dad. And they, you know, when I saw them later, they're like, first of all, you can't believe that your mom was as strong as she is at her age." You know, these are guys that lost family. You know what I mean? Um, they they were but. They sat down with my dad, they spent the day, they brought hoagies, and then they fucking told him everything. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> All the shit that I had hid. And they were laughing so hard, they had tears coming out of their mouths. <laughs> I mean, out of their eyes. They were just <laughs> laughing so hard that they went and ratted me out about what a terrible, you know, <laughs> person I was. And that's how you end up in life. Um, I remember though that Pop always said that um, he told me that you'd be out and you'd be partying. He's like, never hit it though. Never snuck <laughs> into said, the house in my life. He said he would always come in, <laughs> crash in, do it. <laughs> there was something about me. This is the difference between uh, me and my dad. My dad would, like I said, he would be the do the right thing guy. I would be do the wrong thing and brag about it. My dad said to me one time when I was a kid, nothing 
good happens after midnight. And I know what he means by that. Like, this is when you get arrested. This is when you crash cars, when you OD. You know, he said, nothing good. I go, Dad, I don't even want to leave the house to 1230. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That is when everything comes down. <laughs> and by the way, I was like in 10th grade when I said stuff like that. Um, it is uh, It is the truth that you can be so different from somebody and still yeah. love them, you know? And I always thought that my dad and my brother were exactly the same. And then my brother thought that about me and my dad. You know what That's I mean? That's funny. And I go, yeah. oh, he had all your, you guys shared those interests. And my brother thought the same thing about me and my dad. Yeah. You know? One of the things that my, my dad did that was kind of a, a character flaw, when I talked to him, he would brag about everybody else in the family. When, I, when they yeah. talked to him, he would brag about me. But he could never say... Oh, look at you. You're in the Coast Guard. You're crushing it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I always thought, thought that about uh, cousins of mine were the yeah. favorite until they informed me that I was. And right. I was like, I assure you, that's not the case. All they do is talk about you. And it was very funny for us to compare notes about that. He always th saw himself as the conduit who was kind of, you know, spreading the thing around. And he wanted everybody to be proud of everybody. But they, instead, they were like, oh, so that's who you like. Great. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, go here to uh, Wayne in Boston. Hey, Wayne. Hey, Gal, Ronnie B. Um, I'm so sorry for you guys. Um, it's just absolutely awful to hear that because, Ronnie B., when I saw you Saturday night, man, you absolutely killed the room. You were so funny, and with all that stuff going on, you just you just absolutely amazing, and it's heartbreaking to all of us to hear that you were going through that while well, going through that set. And, um you know, I just really wanted to double down what Bobby said. You you were absolutely phenomenal, man. You were great. Well, were so, every, everybody was, all you guys. You were fantastic. And to have you guys come to Boston and, and do that for us, it was just but, thank you, man. And it's I know it's so hard. It sucks. It's awful. And uh, if I could just say, you know, Shreka, Queen Elizabeth, Liz, Carla, Ezra, Bitter, we're all over Twitter just talking about you guys, about how much you guys mean to us. It's it 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 sucks to hear that you're going through this dude but we all go through this you know what i mean yeah but we do I, brother. i'm i'm being honest i couldn't have felt more connected to everybody that i did that night i mean that audience was so fun boston you know is an amazing uh, people and they're you know it's the irish people who believe in this and when i was a kid i forgot who we lost in my family I just felt like I don't want, you know, and my dad or my mom said to me, life goes on. Life is for the, no, life is for the living. Yeah, yeah. And I always remember that. I'm like, yes. You know what I mean? Yes, hurt, but also do that thing, create new memories. I don't have too many ordinary memories from my childhood it was either something wonderful that happened or something horrible that happened but the boring day has fallen aside yeah. you know one of the things that my dad did teach me without meaning to was curiosity you know what i mean when i was a little kid i would read the paper he read the paper when i was a little kid we uh disagreed on things and debated them that's part of what i do for a living one of the things that i remember most in my life you have to remember my father was from world war ii right where like you said he couldn't wait to go and be that war when i was a little kid vietnam was going on my sister's 10 or 11 years older than me she used to go to the hospital she had been dating this guy when he came back from vietnam he was like he didn't want to see anybody he didn't want to see her he didn't want to see his family Whatever had happened over there was awful. She kept going up. She would meet these other guys and bring them home to have a home-cooked meal with us, right? Here's my father, World War II veteran, a patriot. She's bringing home guys that are missing a leg. They're missing the hand, scarred and faced or whatever. To me, they were men. Now I see that they were 18, 19 yeah. years old. These guys would be having dinner, talking about how... You know, they were having troubles adjusting or whatever. After a certain period of time, my father, who had voted for Nixon, voted, you know, wars. He started saying this Vietnam War isn't right. And, bo and before you know it, he was one of the people saying he was against the war. 
Now, it wasn't because of anything more than meeting people who had been through this. He was able to change the way he felt about something as a grown man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, I remember, I think my brother was saying, if I get drafted, uh, I might go to Canada. My dad said, you get drafted, we'll all go to Canada. You know what I mean? Like that was how much he had decided this war was not like the right. other war that he yeah. supported. To be able to do that when you're an adult male is the most important thing. Now, me and him, part of the fun that we would have every Sunday is I'd pick on him about Trump. Yeah. You know what I mean? There would be a time that I was like, oh, I don't think Trump's going to, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to really miss teasing him about impeachment because he <laughs> was like backing Trump up. But we didn't let that get in our way, you know? Well, in, in fact, I, I think it really made your relationship thrive because you guys kept each other on your toes. He loves to do that. Yeah. He loves to have that kind of political argument. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't rather have an easy conversation, no. you know? Uh, I mean, he's, he's too smart for that. So he'd, like, he'd yeah, much he rather really debate and learn something in the process because he absolutely did. He, he stayed curious and stayed learning up until the end. You know, I told you before that my father uh, took all his college courses at night. One of the strangest and greatest memories is, is I would be sleeping. I'd be wake up in the middle of the night. I would come downstairs and I'd say, what are you reading? And then he would tell me what he was studying. And it could be physics. It could be anything. But there was a time that he was doing Greek mythology. And he read me all about this stuff from different Greek mythology. And I remember when we got to Achilles. And Achilles, they had, and he would read aloud. And I would just sit and listen to him. And I was a little kid. And they had dipped him in this uh, river that, you know, would make him invincible. But from where they held on, his heel was exposed. So when he got shot in the arrow in, in, in the heel, he died. And I yelled out, it's not fair. You know what I mean? Like I was broken hearted because the Achilles was like a um, thing. He read me Dante's Inferno. It was a very different kind of thing. And it... Um, and most of the time, he led by example. I also want to say this. I saw my dad come home every night. And the first thing, my mom would hand him a cocktail. And he would drink that cocktail when he came in. I could count on one hand the number of times I saw my dad drunk. Yeah. You know what I mean? He didn't have the addictive personality that I have. Yeah. It was in other people in our family, but it wasn't in him. He... uh he was such an old school guy. He was a guy of his times, and he was also incredibly different. Every dad in my neighborhood stopped at the bar on the way home. My father came straight home. Yeah, I think that too. I think that there's something about him like he's such a throwback guy or that he is of his time. And yet, I really truly think that um, he's like nothing no one else you know because he was so remarkable so you can't really say oh he's like the kind of guy you expect because uh there was nothing really ordinary about him in that way they were so old school that my dad used to come home hand over his paycheck to my mom she would pay the bills there was never any kind of debate about it you know yeah there was never a time in my life i ever saw him pull a wad of cash out of his pocket because he felt like that was the family's money i mean it was a different it was a different time. Um, I know uh, my mom was telling me that uh, my two sisters got there after he passed away. And they were uh, standing over him. And uh, my sister Cindy leaned over and gave him a kiss and said thank you. There's no way to describe that. That's the line, man. That's the truth. That's the thing that you want to do. I thank everybody for listening to us talk about my dad today. And I'm glad I got a chance to share this with you, Gail. Yeah, me too. Wish I would have uh, thought about it a little more. I want to go out with a song 
Uh, I probably haven't heard this song since I was a kid. And I remember uh, this was my father's favorite singer, Peggy Lee. And I hope we got the, the correct version of this. Uh, but I got to trust the team. But I remember this song when I heard it was a kid. When I was a kid, even scared me a little bit. I'm like, what the hell? And he just loved this uh, song. Um, we'll see you guys when we get back here next week. And thank you for your understanding and letting us talk about Lee uh, Lee Bennington. That meant a lot to us. <laughs> 